So this elderly couple noticed that they were starting to forget things, so they were concerned and went to their doctor. The doctor said, well, it's just part of being old, and if you want to remember things, just write them down. So that night they were in bed, and the husband was uh, getting up to go to the kitchen, and the wife says, hey, could you get me a bowl of ice cream? And he said, sure. He said, don't you think you should write it down? The doctor said, you should write it down. He said, write it down? It's only ice cream. I can remember that. And then she said, oh, I want strawberries with the ice cream. Can you add some strawberries? And he said, sure. He said, but don't you want to write it down? You should write it down so you don't forget. So I can remember ice cream and strawberries. And I, I want some whipped cream on it. Can you add some whipped cream on it too? And she said, and then uh, he says, I'm going to remember it. I don't need to write it down. Ice cream with strawberries and whipped cream. So he goes into the kitchen. 30 minutes later, he comes out and hands his wife a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> the wife stares at the plate for a moment and shakes her head in disgust and said, you forgot my toast. <laughs> 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 so, 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 how many people have heard that statistic that says we only use 10% of our brain or 10% of our potential? How many people have heard that? You know, that's not true. Uh, but it is mostly true that we have more, science says that we have more brain power, more brilliance, more talent, ability, and genius than we realize, and far, far more than we actually utilize and apply in our daily lives. How many people would admit that there's one area in your life, at least one area, where you're not fully applying yourself or doing your best in something you'd like to have improved? Anybody? How many people, um, if you had to start, if you could start your life over again, believe that you would create and experience and enjoy so much more than what you've done up to this point? How many people agree with that? And last one is, even from now, whatever's going on in your life, how many people know you still have the potential for greater happiness, love, success, and all yours? How many people agree? You know, Buckminster Fuller said, I am convinced that all of humanity is born with more gifts, talent, and potential than they know. Most are born geniuses, but the process of living degeniuses us. That we all have genius and brilliance within us, but somehow, society, culture, our families, religion dissuade, uh, they don't recognize, dismiss, and even devalue so that some of these incredible, brilliant things within ourselves lay dormant and are underutilized. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 2 said, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, he's saying if you want your life to get better, if you want it to change or improve, begin by renewing and transforming your mind and not conforming to the things that degenius us and hold us back from expressing the greatness within ourselves. There are six things that we do that we begin to participate in degeniusing and holding back our own greatness. And here are the things, by not using our mind as effectively as we, we can, because we can transform our lives through our mind. And here are the six things we conform to that don't help us express our genius. And the first one is worry. How many people here worry or ever worried a lot? How many people worry so much and when you have nothing to worry about, you get worried? Anybody have... Uh, Worry consumes us. It means to choke off. That word, the word worry comes from the root word, to choke off. We choke off the flow of our genius, our goodness, and joy. Second thing we do to conform to the patterns that aren't healthy for us is we fill our minds with fearful thoughts, fear and doubt. The third thing is that we think negatively. We think, oh, there'll be no solution. This will never work. This isn't right. Um, and then the, the, the fourth one is uh, thoughts of lack and scarcity. There's never enough. There's not enough time. There's not enough ideas. There's not enough money. Uh, another one is worthy. When we feel unworthy, it is hard for us to express our beauty, our greatness, and our genius. And the last thing that we do that we, to not conform to is when we compare ourselves to others and judge ourselves against others. Einstein said, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by how he climbs a tree... It'll believe it's stupid all of its life. And so there are ways that we hold ourselves back. We have this brilliant mind, this incredible brain, but we don't utilize it the most effective, you know, to bring forth the genius and the brilliance that is within us. There's a fabulous book called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci by Michael Gleb. And in it, he said that 
Uh, Leonardo da Vinci is the greatest genius of all great geniuses, including Einstein and um, you know, Tesla, Shakespeare, Madame Curie, Galileo. Um, and I, at the time, before I reading this book, I only knew um, da Vinci from the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. But da Vinci was born in uh, 1452. 1452. He was not only an artist, he was an architect, a sculptor, an inventor. He invented the first um, prototype for the helicopter, for a parachute, for the ex extendable bladder, um, a th the th three-speed gear shift, uh, for a machine cutting uh, threads uh, in a screw, for the bicycle, for the adjustable monkey wrench, the snorkel, the hydraulic jack, for the first revolving stage, the locks for a canal, horizontal water wheel, folding furniture, um, the olive press, uh, and a water-powered alarm clock. I would have loved to have seen that one. <laughs> he was a military engineer. He came up with all kinds of weapons. He, he was a scientist. He was the first to ever make a cast of the ventricles and of the brain. He pioneered the botanical science, being the first one to explore the phenomenon of soil erosion. Forty years before Copernicus, he said the sun does not move. Two hundred years before Newton, he said every weight tends to fall uh, to the center by the shortest way possible. Da Vinci was a genius. But the genius thing is, it was not how intelligent he was, or was not how much he accomplished. It was the mindset out of which he looked at life. It was the way he used his mind to extract the greatest ideas and possibilities within him. Michael Gleb in his book says, we all have genius. The only thing is we don't know how to use it to tap into our mind to bring it forth in the greatest ways. And he said there are seven Da Vincian principles, seven Da Vincian mindsets that he utilized that made his mind and his brain such an open channel for the in deeper inspiration, greatness, uh, and genius to come forth from within him. So what we're going to do for the next uh, two weeks, we're going to look at the seven Da Vincian principles for drawing forth and bringing forth your greatness and the genius within. Today we're only going to look at the first two. Next week we'll look at the first five because these, I think, are worth uh, a little extra time. And so the first thing to bring forth and unleash the genius within us is to develop a curious mind, to have a curious mind. Da Vinci was curious about life he was curious about flowers. He was curious about trees. He was curious about the sun and the stars and machinery and everything uh, and of how everything worked. And it was because of his curiosity, it opened a path for his genius and, and, and creativity to come forth. Now, often our idea of curiosity is only for two things, cats <laughs> and kids. That's, you know, we think you know, it is for the immature mind who is, isn't quite uh, grown up yet. You know, I, I, I love being fascinated by things. When I was a kid, the most fascinating thing I thought was my sister's Easy Bake Oven. And the thing, I was fascinated how a light bulb could bake a cake. Really, isn't that not amazing? I still think I am fascinated by that. My question is, what, you, what fascinates you in life? A fascinated, curious mind keeps us engaged and active and alive. It actually helps us grow and learn and expand and bring forth even more uh, brilliant and wonderful ideas. And I talk about continued curiosity because we are born curious, but somehow we, we get conditioned out of it and it disconnects us from our true self. It disconnects us from greater possibilities and that, that inner joy. You know, Jesus said, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must become as a child. Thank you, there are three people who know that. <laughs> but to become a child, children are innocent, pure. They're creative. They see possibilities. They try and, uh, and explore and examine things. I mean, it is a beautiful and wonderful thing. So one of the first ways to awaken this Da Vincian quality in ourselves is to rediscover play to rediscover joy and creativity and fun, you know, and art and writing and other forms of your creative expression, to begin to, 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 to bring those forth. Because curiosity energizes and engages us and helps us learn, explore, and discover more, more within ourselves and more within our world. Einstein said, I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious. Michael Gleb says that great minds are curious minds. Great minds ask great questions. And sometimes it's important to ask why or why not 
Or how does this work? How could we make it work better? How can I approach or see this situation from a more positive perspective? You know, what is the best decision for me in this particular situation for it to improve? Asking questions. Asking is a powerful thing. When Jesus said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened unto you for everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks the door will be opened. You know, we have to realize that the quality of our lives is reflected in the quality of questions that we ask. Asking questions comes from two places, frustration or fascination. When we're frustrated with how things are are going or having some negative reaction, we ask questions like, why is this happening to me again? Why am I the one that always gets hurt? Why do I always struggle with money? Why do I always get passed over in the promotions? You know, when, you know, when will my bad luck end? You know, why can't I find someone? These are questions out of frustration. And you even hear them, the question almost at wants to attract more of the, the thing that we don't want. And the other one is the aspects of asking questions from a place of fascination, of curiosity to learn, to discover, and to call for something good. Questions like, what can I do to help improve my relationship? How can I experience more peace of mind and inner joy? What can I learn from this challenging situation? Or what do I need to stop doing in my life that, to, to make my life better? And what do I need to start doing? What do I need to let go? What in me needs some healing and attention? You know, how can I better serve my fellow man? How can I add more laughter and playfulness and joy into my life? How can I better express the gifts that are within me? And so what are the quality of questions that you're asking life? What is it that you're really seeking? You know, what door are you knocking on that you want to be opened that will bring you greater joy and happiness? Do you know Socrates says that every one of us has genius and brilliance and knowledge within us, but questions are the way that we bring it out. By asking powerful, good quality questions, it draws out our brilliance, our genius, our greatness. It brings forth the desires of our hearts and the things that we want to create and experience. Martin Luther King had a curious mind, and he asked the question, how can we achieve freedom and equality for all people? Nelson Mandela asked, how can we end apartheid? Henry Ford asked, "How how do you make a car and how can I mass produce them? Ray Kroc said, how can I get a good hamburger when I'm traveling on the road? (laughs) And he bought McDonald's and literally revolutionized the fast food industry. And so my question is, what are the questions you want to ask life? What are the big curious questions? Questions are really um, about your curiosity of possibility. So when Jesus said, ask and you shall receive, he's saying, be curious. It's unlimited. Expand your heart and your mind to greater possibilities. And so the thing is, for us to awaken the genius within ourselves, we need to renew our mind by reawakening our curiosity like a child. Be fascinated by the things that are around you. You know, find that fascination and ask great questions of possibilities, of curious things, of why not? How about this? How can my life get better? How can I have greater joy and fulfillment in my life? Ask these questions because they open our minds to possibilities and to bring forth the genius within us. And the second one is to aliven our experiences. One of the things is that uh, Da Vinci believed is you've got life has to be experienced. You can't just talk about it. You can't just read about it. You have to live it and experience it. You have to taste it richly and deeply. It's one thing to read about eating a ripe, juicy, sweet peach. It's a whole other thing to experience it. It's one thing to read about a passionate, wonderful kiss. It's a whole different thing to experience it. How many people remember the movie Goodwill Hunting? Remember Goodwill Hunting? Robin Williams, um, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon. Matt Damon was this really, really genius, intelligent, overly intelligent guy, uh, but he struggled in an area of, of being vulnerable and opening up in his relationships and feeling his feelings. And sometimes we can hide behind our intelligence and it, it, it stops from, from truly feeling and experiencing life. And in this one scene, 
you know, Matt Damon is sort of avoiding going to feelings and, avoid, and, go, and you know, sharing about his, how smart he is. And Robin Williams said, you know, you might know every detail about the Sistine Chapel, and you may have read Oliver Twist and know all about it, but the truth is you don't know what the Sistine Chapel smells like, and you don't know what it's like to really be an orphan. And what he was trying to say, I like that apparently more than you, but that was a great scene in the movie. And what he was saying is like, you know, you can know stuff, but it's only when you experience things. And it's about opening our hearts to feel and really be fully present to the experiences that are in our lives. Da Vinci said that we need to use our five senses to truly feel and experience life because that's what's opened us to a fuller and richer experience of life. Here's what he said. He said, the five senses are the ministers of the soul, yet the average person looks without seeing, listens without hearing, touches without feeling, eats without tasting, and moves without physical awareness, inhales without the awareness of odor or fragrance, and talks without thinking. Dimitri was saying we need to aliven and awaken our lives by being present to our senses, appreciating them and using them and enjoying them, because that's what helps us feel more fully alive. Og Mandino talked about uh, being a part of the living dead. The times we're moving around, but we're not living. We're not feeling. We're not experiencing. Sometimes we're so busy that in our thing, we, we jam, we ram down our food, down our throat. We don't even taste it. Sometimes we, we move by people and don't, uh, don't feel them. We feel disconnected from our own lives, even though that we are alive. You know, so many things we miss out on by not being present and experiencing them. I told you, I went, I think it was about five years now, I went to a silent retreat. It was a 10-day silent retreat, and uh, we meditated. We did not speak at all, and we meditated for 11 hours a day. And I'll tell you, you couldn't talk, you couldn't do, and you, you ate alone, you did everything alone. And one of the most amazing experiences for me, and I've shared this, was eating in silence, not looking or talking to anyone, just being there alone with the food and connecting with yourself. And I'll tell you, I like uh, peanut butter on toast, but I'll tell you, eating that peanut butter on toast alone in quiet, the toast never felt as crunchy, and the peanut butter never felt as creamy and smooth. It was a whole layer and level of life and experience that I was missing on that I do every single day. But because I was more awakened to my senses and absolutely present to it, it absolutely enriched a simple activity like eating into something you know, more, more fulfilling, uh, more, more, more uh, nourishing and more meaningful. You know, several years ago, I went on a ski trip to Breckenridge, Colorado. They have an adaptive ski program there. I was flying in on uh, the Sunday night. It was on Monday morning and I fl flew out on Tuesday. I woke up on the Monday morning with chills and a fever, feeling horrible, thinking there's no way I can get out of this bed. And this other part of me was like, heck, man, I didn't come all this way to not experience skiing. I'd never been downhill skiing before. I went cross-country skiing in Canada when I was a kid, and I hated it. And so <laughs> I wanted to try this downhill skiing thing. So I went there, got, got the training. Going up, you know, the, the, the lift was so gorgeous, so beautiful to see the trees and the snow. Coming down a few times, and there was a trainer and a trainee, an instructor and a trainee. And the instructor was saying, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. Go back and forth and back and forth. Don't go down too fast. And then so after three uh, times down the hill, the trainer left and I was left with the trainee. Hey, hey. So I started cutting down fast. I went so fast. I was out of control. I did a complete flip in the air and just crashed into the snow. And the, the, um, the a trainee came and said, man, you okay? You okay? And I said, hey, did I do a somersault, man? I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. What am I going to do a somersault? It was one of the best experiences of my life to have experienced. I could have read all I did about skiing, but it was one of the great experiences of my adult life. Just got back from an Alaskan cruise with my family, and just beholding the beauty of nature was such an incredible experience. Being with my family, eating uh, and laughing, it was incredible. And then I got the gift of something that was not COVID, but really resembled it, and it knocked me on my butt 
from the time I left the cruise, I, for, for 10 days, I've been really, really sick and not, not feeling my best. And so at the beginning, it was like, how do I bring my senses into this experience while I feel like I'm swallowing razor blades and my head hurts and I got a fever and backache? But I'll tell you, after a couple of days, I started realizing that I need to just go with this. And so I felt all those things. I enjoyed my egg drop soup. I watched movies. I slept. I did some emails as I could. And I got to experience it instead of hating it. We avoid so many experiences because they're not comfortable. But all experiences must be felt and, and tasted and experienced so that we're fully engaged and fully alive in it. And my question is, what are the things that you want to experience and what are the things that you're currently experiencing that you could experience more by letting yourself t taste it and smell it and touch it and feel it and truly experiencing it at a far deeper level, just like I did with eating that peanut butter on toast? Because the truth is, whether it is uh, eating food or going on some adventurous thing or beholding the beauty of nature or getting sick, life is meant to be experienced. And it's what enriches us. I bet you if we did nothing different activities otherwise, other than lending ourselves to be more present to where, what we're doing, we will feel more fulfilled and more joyful and more happy. Yesterday, I had an interesting and fabulous experience. I married a couple who had already been married to each other for 30 years. They separated for, th for three years. They got divorced. They've been together for the last 18 years. And after being together for 50 years, yesterday, they decided to get married. And their son was there, their two grandkids were there, the groom's um, brother was there, and it was an amazing experience to see people who have been through so much together, highs and lows and ups and downs, and at 82 and 73 respectively, decided they wanted to experience getting married again. I tell you, it was an honor to be a part of it, and it was a great experience for me. Life is a beautiful thing. And we miss out on so much by holding back or avoiding things instead of diving in and letting ourselves feel it. From our food to the beauty of nature to being with our loved ones and looking at and smiling at them while we look into their eyes. All these incredible experiences are there if we lend ourselves to it and deepen ourselves in them. You know, the Middle Ages uh, were um, from the 1476 to about the 14th century, about a thousand years. It's marked and also called the Dark Ages because it, there was a decline in culture. There was a decline in science that people weren't learning and they weren't growing. And there were, then there was the Renaissance. And this was like an awakening of creativity and innovation and inventions. And life came back again. It was a rebirth. And when we aren't tapping in to the genius within, it's like the dark ages with ourselves. We're not growing, but it's like a rebirth when we awaken our curiosity and when we're fascinated by life and ask big questions, curious questions of possibility, and when we allow ourselves to experience our senses of all experiences. So this week, I encourage you to awaken your curiosity and to enliven your senses and all the things you experience, because they are the first two steps to unleash the genius within you. God bless you all.